He was a dying man who let us witness the last stages of his journey. Maybe the distance between life and death isn't as great as you think. He was, at one and the same time, original and unpredictable. I think I'm less humble now than I was before. Really? Believe it or not. He shared his fears openly. Is it uh, horrible, death? Are you choking? Or, uh, yeah. How long? And he shared his many lessons. I have a little aphorism. Don't let go too soon, but don't hang on too long. Find the balance. Conversations with Maury Schwartz. Lessons on living. There is one fundamental difference between this program as you watch it tonight and the version which appeared on Nightline. Maury Schwartz is dead now, and we know how the end came. He died at home within just a few hours, as it turned out, of Yitzhak Rabin's assassination. That event obviously got a whole lot more attention and was totally unexpected. Maury's death had been anticipated for some time. And when it came, it was almost a footnote to the process of dying, which he had chosen to share with his family and friends and ultimately with a national television audience. I learned of Maury through a long and sensitive piece in the Boston Globe. Here was this 70-something former sociology professor from Brandeis who was dying and who thought that he might do some good by sharing with people what dying was all about. What began as a journalistic project for me quickly evolved into a personal friendship. What began as an idea for one program ultimately became three. The point is that neither Maury nor I knew when our relationship began quite where and how it would end. Looking back on it, I think everyone involved was glad that we'd done it. At the outset, though, Maury wasn't altogether sure that he wanted to do a television interview with me, but he was willing to consider the proposition. I had to audition for the supporting role in this human drama. Maury was afraid I might be too stuck up for the part. Television anchors who normally enjoy a broad, if shallow, fame tend to diminish in importance in direct proportion to where you're going. Maury is going to die. Before he does, he has some preconceptions about me that he wanted to share. You're narcissistic. I'm narcissistic? Yeah. No. You're, you're not really. I'm too ugly to be narcissistic. I thought you was a narcissist when I saw you on TV. Really? Yep. Why is that? Because you, you acted as if you knew everything. And I said to your crew today, this is going to be a tough one for him because he doesn't know anything about dying. That's true. No. And, and I know more than you do. He does indeed. Maury, and it's not out of lack of respect, but at his insistence that everyone calls him by his first name, Maury knows more about dying than most people would care to learn. He suffers from a disease called ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. While the senses and the intellect remain intact until death, the nerve cells which feed and stimulate the body's muscles gradually disintegrate. Maury has already lost the use of his legs. Before too long, the hands and arms will go, and eventually he will lose the ability to chew and swallow and talk. So while he still can, this one-time sociology professor at Brandeis, he does, to the joy and amazement of family and a widening circle of friends alike. I, I half-kiddingly uh, told some of my friends it's sort of like driving Professor Daisy, uh, in that there's just a, a, a wonderful charm and, uh, and warmth to him that you know, makes this uh, a joy in many ways. Nine million people out there, give or take you know, yeah, half a million here million. or there. Nine million people who are watching you right now. Right and saying, what can this old guy tell me that's going to help me when I get to a similar point? I mean, we're not all going to die the same way. I can give you a number of statements, didactic, one, two, three, four, that may or may not mean any of you. First, talk about it. Don't hide in the corner. Don't try to conceal it as if it's something horrible, because all it does is destroy your self-esteem. It's very important to keep that self-esteem. 
to accept it. This is you. You are a disabled person. I am a, I'm not ashamed of that as long as I have my mind and my heart. Three, keep an open heart and open it up further and further and further until you encompass as much as you can with your love. It sounds kind of soppy, but it's not. It's not. Four, be alert and aware to the things that really interest you and go for it. Be involved. Five, be compassionate. Be compassionate to yourself, to other people. Six, treat yourself gently. Be kind to yourself. You didn't create your illness, so you shouldn't be punishing yourself for having that illness. Okay, yes, I said something about morning before. The morning never stops. There are some mornings when I cry and cry and mourn and mourn for myself. That this is my sorry pass. I got dealt this hand. Some mornings I'm angry and bitter, but it doesn't last too long. Then I get up and say, I want to live. So I have to cry and I have to mourn, but I also have to enjoy the life I have left. Maury is the first to admit his good fortune in having such a vast support system surrounding him. Get this support system. As many people around you who love you as you possibly can, stay with them. They'll stay with you and they'll come back and forth and so on, let you know that they love you. And let you know that you matter to them in their lives. I tell you have a title for it? No, what? Ah, after six years, a title. Ah, right. Somebody said, look, with what you're going through, is there anything you'd like to ask of us? You know, is there any way we can be helpful? And Maurice said in his typical way, let me think about it. So the next time we met two weeks later, he had a list. He said, you know, if you really want to help, these are things I'd like. If you don't, that's okay, too. And the list, uh, remember, it started out with uh, call me a lot. You know, I like to talk on the phone. Send me funny things to read. Uh, go to the movies with me, uh, if we can arrange that. You know, come over and, and spend time. And he went through a list, and, and people were touched and moved. And uh, I began to get the awareness that rather than retreating, as many people do, Maury, who's very fluid and free with his feelings, as you've probably seen, um, rather than withdrawing, has really reached out and said, look, and you're, you're my friends. If you want to be helpful, this is what I'd like. Hi, Nina. How you doing? This is a time to do a life review, to make amends, to identify and let go of regrets, to come to terms with your unresolved relationships. May I be full of peace. May I be full of joy. May I be free from suffering. And just one phrase at a time, see if you can get behind each phrase. Really wishing yourself well. See how full you can be with each phrase. You told me that you were an agnostic from the time you were 16 until recently. What changed your mind? My impending death. And my meditation teacher and a growing sense of the interconnectedness between all of us. I don't know if we have time for me to tell you the story about the wave. It'll take about two minutes. You want to hear it? There's this little wave, this he wave, who's bobbing up and down, I'll shorten it, bobbing up and down on the ocean, having a great time, and all of a sudden he recognizes he's going to crash into the shore. And this big, wide ocean, he's now walking, moving toward the shore. And he gets annihilated. He gets so despairing. My God, what's going to happen to me? And he's got this sour, despairing look on his face. Along comes a female wave, bobbing up and down, having a great time. And the female wave says to the male wave, why are you so depressed? Mail said, you don't understand. You're going to crash into that shore, and you'll be nothing. She says, you don't understand. You're not a wave. You're part of the ocean. 
That's what I believe. You're part of the ocean. That's right. I'm not a wave. I'm part of all of humanity. So you're not going to die? I'm going to die, but I'm also going to live on. In some other form, who knows? But I truly believe that I am part of a larger whole of some power. People call it God. I don't know if that's the right term for it. But I had to take time to get there. And now is the time to be there. But it's all a mystery. I still don't know the answer. I don't want to represent myself as a girl. I'm struggling to find what the answer is. But what I do know, what for me is the best way to handle this fatal illness and move into the next domain, whatever that is. Maury, you and I are doing something that, that doesn't seem to be much in favor in this mm. country. We're not only talking mm. about death, we're, we're laughing, right. right? We're making jokes about it, uh, being, absolutely. being a little bit irreverent about it. Absolutely. Uh, although there are times when clearly... I am very sad about it. Very uh, sad. Uh, uh, yeah. You clearly feel that we should talk about it more. More and more and more. For me, it's one of the most important things. If you hide it, it generates inside you. You suffer with it. You think it's so horrible. My meditation teacher told me something that blew my mind the other day. I wish you were here. Narayan, where are you? She said to me, Maury, maybe your view of life and death should be reconsidered. Maybe the distance between life and death isn't as great as you think. And I said, you mean it's not a chasm? The two mountains and that big valley between? I, this is my words now. You mean it's only a little bridge across a small river? I don't know. But there's another view. This culture is so stuck on death in terms of its fear, hiding it, not knowing what to do with it, that what I'm saying is there's an alternative way of looking at it. There's a charming quality to dying in that it teaches us a level of humility that we're incapable of having, I suppose, yeah. while we're healthy, while we're just full of the sense of our own importance and Vitality. Right, right. Now, of course, the minute that you have a disease that you know is going to kill you, right. it induces humility, doesn't it? Well, Fred, I would, uh, Fred, Ted, I would well, say, say that. Now, that's inducing uh, humility. Right, yes. right. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I think I'm less humble now than I was before. Really? Believe it or not. Because I think I have some things to offer the world. I told you I was getting grandiose. Not swell-headed, but grandiose. I think that up to now, I've been teaching small little classes, Brandeis kids, you know, who are going to go out and be lawyers, go out and be doctors. They'll do something good in the world, aside from making lots of money for themselves, which is so many of their objectives. But now, I think that I'm able to do something through you and through other vehicles that I wasn't able to do before as a teacher. So, but if you mean humility, a real sense that I'm a simple human being like everybody else, vulnerable like everybody else, bound to die like everybody else, yes, I feel that very strongly. A part of the ocean. A part of the ocean, very true, very true. I'd like to talk to you. Um, people with ALS, um, when they begin to have the respiratory failure, I sometimes they're traped. They'll have a, a hole cut here, and they'll be traped. Um, and then they'll be put on a ventilator so they can breathe better. Well, that's a decision that I'll have to talk with my sons and my mm -hmm. wife about. Mm -hmm. I assume you've seen a lot of people on these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the quality of their life? 
Well, can they interact with people? Sure, sure. Are they energetic in the same way I am energetic now? Well, are they alive? Are they taking the world in? What are people you're going to be able to do dealing with them? Uh, or mm -hmm. All those things? What's the alternative if I don't take this thing? That would be respiratory failure. It would be much, That's much, a good way to go. much more quickly. Is it uh, horrible death? Are you choking? Or, uh, yeah. For how long? It would come. The choking starts. Um, you know, your, your swallowing ability is fine right now, obviously. Um, you'll have more decreased ability to swallow. You'll have episodes where you choke, and then eventually that's usually how you, you will die. You'll choke to on? death. Talk about it for a moment. What, what happens with Lou Gehrig's disease? A lot of people out there don't know what Lou Gehrig's disease is. I don't know a lot about it either, but I'll tell you what I do know. The nurse was just here today. My hands are going, which is the next phase after the legs. What does that mean when you say your hands are going? I won't be able to use them in a short while. Things are very heavy to pick up. You used a cruder example when we were in your bedroom before. Should I say it on TV? Go ahead and say it on TV, because in many respects, I think it brings it home far more than everything else you've been okay. talking about. Okay, I'll say it on TV then. Somebody's going to have to wipe my ass. I won't be able to do that for myself. Now that's getting pretty far dependent. And one of the things I say in my reflections is indulge your dependency if you can't avoid it. Maury, this, this conversation is by mutual agreement. Absolutely. Okay. I want you to confront for me for a moment the penultimate moment. When I die? No. That's the ultimate moment. Oh, you want one more before that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I want you to confront, confront for me the moment when your still active mind is a prisoner of your no longer functioning body. Now, I know you've thought about that. Of course I have. And I know that has to scare the hell out of you. Not yet. Not yet. It'll scare the hell out of me when I get there. It just scares me a little bit now. When I'm at that moment, then I'll see how scared I am. But, but, I have to make a decision, not by myself, but with my friends and family, as to when it is enough. Good no more. I don't want it. So, that's is, that, is that your right? My right, with my friends and family, absolutely. Not mine alone. What you're talking about is, is death. death. Absolutely. But not waiting for it. No, doing it when I feel that the quality of my life has been destroyed to such a degree that I can't go on because I don't want to go on. It isn't worth going on. It isn't worth going on because I'm not able to do the things that make me who I am, like relating to people with affect with enthusiasm, with, on the other hand, on the other hand, and I have to give you the other hand. When I talk to this with, about this with my meditation teacher, she said, maybe you'll want to go on just to be an inspiration to other people. So I have to consider this, too. Can I be? Will I be? Might I be? Must you be? Must I be? It's all up for grabs. I don't know the answer right now. When this all started, I said to myself, am I going to live or am I going to die? Meaning by that, am I going to withdraw like most people probably do and give up on the world because it's been so horrible to me now? Or am I going to live? I decide I'm going to live. But can I live the way I want to live? The way I try to reflect somewhat in those reflections? As I said, with dignity, with courage, with humor, with relatedness. Again, I didn't know whether I could do it or not at that moment. 
But I said, I'm going to try my best. I made a willful determination to call on all my resources to enable me to live with composure, as I put it. And so far, uh, I'm able to do it. Whether I'll be able to continue when that moment comes, I don't know. But I'm betting on myself that I will. After we'd finished the formal portion of that first interview, Maury and I continued to chat while the cameraman was shooting a different angle. Later, when I heard what was on the tape, I called Maury to ask if we could use it. And he agreed. Are you going to be able to stay at home until the end? I'm going to stay at home till I die. I'm not going anywhere. That's our understanding. I'm going to die right here. I'm not going to the hospital. So no, indeed, I'm going to stay home as long as I can. Now, maybe the last few days, what have you, I can't, but that will be a few days only. Yeah. And maybe I'll tell you a secret. If I go to the hospital, I'll be able to get the lethal dose that I want at that last moment. We were actually waiting for Maury's condition to worsen significantly before flying up to Boston to record a second interview, but he called me in May and expressed concern about how much longer he'd be able to speak. He'd gotten a lot of good reaction to the first program back in March, and frankly, I think he was just a little eager to do another one. Hi. How you doing? I went back to see Murray a few days ago because he called to say that he didn't know how much longer he would have the ability to speak. You, you look fine. That's what everybody tells me. You sound fine. That's what everybody tells me. So how do you know that things are going downhill? Nobody can know it but I. I know it, one, that my swallowing is more difficult now. I cough a lot. I sometimes have to chew my food very, very finely to get it down. And I don't know how long that will last, but that's the first big thing. The second big thing is that my voice is somewhat slurred. You may not hear it, but when I make the L sounds, it gets into the throat rather than out there. Slurred. That's also the beginning signs of losing your voice, losing my voice. And I figured, Ted, if you're going to come back when I have a voice, it's not going to do you much good. What about your hands, Maureen? That's we uh, we, we had that delicate standard that you and I set, the ass-wiping standard. Still doing it. Well, I'm happy to hear <laughs> Thank that. You. However, it is getting more and more difficult for me to feed myself. I can hard, for example, I can hardly get around here when I shave in the morning and when I eat if the table is too low, I cannot lift it all the way. There's like a big weight on my hands. So those are the significant changes that have occurred since you left. What do the, what do the medical experts tell you? I mean, what is, the, what is the timetable? They do not know. They do not know. ALS is very unpredictable. But my guess is, the losses will come within minimum, uh, maximum of three to six months. And, I, but they really don't know. Emotionally, how do you feel? Very high. Very high? Yeah. Is that, a, is that a constant? Not a constant, but I go up and down, of course. Here's how emotions go. When I have people and friends here, of which I have a large number, I'm usually very up because interaction and relationships and, and the loving relationships I have just maintain me. They just keep me alive in a very, very vital way. Now there are days when I'm depressed. Let me not deceive you. When I see my hands going, a certain dread arises in me. What am I going to do without my hands? I'll have no control anymore. Control, either physical control or command. Well, that'll come to the voice. Or command control when my voice goes. So there are a lot of things that are happening. The voice and the hands, the swallowing, I don't care so much about, so they'll feed me through a tube. 
But these two things are such an essential part of me. I'm a Jewish man. I talk with my hands, you know. And I have Jewish inflections sometimes. I like to use Yiddish words. That'll be all gone. What do I do? And how will I be? Talk to me a little bit about just contemplating silence. The fact of the matter is, all my life, I have expected to talk ever since I learned how to talk. And that expectation is ingrained in me. Just like you expect to live, that when you have to face non-living or non-talking, it's a tremendous shock. So I'm saying to myself, what will it be like when I cannot articulate anything, when I can't give a command or control or ask for something or say something that is in my heart or in my head. I don't know what it will be like. But I'm also saying, hey, it will be terrible for a while. Not by be depressed for a while. But I'm going to find a way to take advantage of silence. Because maybe that's the way to really hear yourself. And maybe that's the way to really hear some of these spiritual things I've been concerned about and involved with in terms of the meditative practice. One of my colleagues, Dan, was talking to one of your friends <clears throat> who told him that he is going deaf and that you, as you have just told us, are now contemplating what it is going to be like <clears throat> being without speech. And so he spoke of this anticipated moment in both your lives when he, without hearing, and you, without speech, will be sitting there together contemplating. What do you think that's going to be like? There's going to be lots of love passing between us. And you don't need speech or hearing for that. And I know about whom you're talking, my dear friend Maury Stein, and Maury and Stein and I have had a 35-year relationship, and we may not need speech or hearing. We just may need to be in each other's presence in which we experience the depth of our feeling for each other. Now, they might, that might not be enough, but it's a considerable amount. Hi, Maury. Hi, Maury. Hi, Maury. <laughs> That's really Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Hello? Yeah. Hi, Fern. How are you going to go on giving when you no longer have the use of your voice? Are you coming? It's going to be an interesting challenge. I might tell my friends, which I am right now by saying this, you frame your questions in yes or no ways. Tell me what's in your heart and in your mind. And if there's some question you want to ask about it, just put it in that way. You can tell me what you're thinking and feeling, it. there's no question involved, and you'll feel my response. I won't be able to articulate it. You'll see it in my face. My face, I think, will still be very mobile. And I can give a lot of communication with my mobile face. But if it's an issue that they're pondering, would like my help for, then I'll ask them to frame it in yes or no. And I can say yes or no. So that's the way I think about it now. I hope I'll discover new means and mechanisms when the time arrives. After you were on Nightline the last time, you got some reaction. I sure did. Tell me about it. Well, there were lots of letters. This is from a teacher in a small Pennsylvania town called Perkiomen Valley Middle School. And he, she has four girls and five boys, 10 to 13 eight years of age. Each of these kids lost a parent. 
and she's trying to get them talk about it in the group. And the kids, especially the boys, are having a very hard time talking about it. And this is what I said. Dear Barbara Cott, that's the teacher, I was moved by your letter, this is me writing, and feel that the work you are doing with the children who have lost a parent is very important. I also lost a parent at an early age. I lost my mother, and you see I still can cry about her, at age eight. And it's quite a blow to me. I wish I had had a group like yours where I would have been able to talk about my sorrows and share, even, even though it might have been hard to talk about my feelings. I would have joined your group because I was so lonely. Right now, I find I can't do it alone either. But I have my friends around me to keep me talk to help me talk about my illness. I send each of you and all of you as a group my warm thoughts and hope for your continued work together to help each other. As I have, as I talk with my friends. I will think of you talking with yours warmly, Maury. Maury, that was, that was 70 years ago that your mother died. And it still chokes you up. And when you, when you read your own words <clears throat> about how lonely you were back then, that's still a very real and present pain with you, isn't it? It goes on. The pain. You know what strikes me as so strange about that? You are so brave and cheerful about your own condition now. And I just wonder why it is that something that happened so long ago is so much more painful to you. Ed, that has nothing to do with bravery. All it has to do with feeling. I don't feel any less powerful just because I've cried about my mother's death. As a matter of fact, tears for me strengthen me. They don't weaken me. When I cry, I cry about a lot of things all at once. And it includes my own demise. I get precipitated by the ancient, if you want to put it that way, 70-year-old pain. It gets precipitated by my identification with these young kids who are suffering in the same way I am. And sometimes, believe it or not, I cry for the pain of the world. Not often enough, I'm afraid, but there's a hell of a lot of pain in this world. Now it needs Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday. So what do you think I'm going to find the next time I come to visit? Thursday. Okay. When are you going to call me next time? Well, if I'm not talking, there's no point in calling you, is there? You want me to call you right before I can't talk anymore, if I can judge that? Because that's the critical thing between us. If we're going to be on TV, I can't do it with sign language. So I guess that's the answer. If I lose my arms, it doesn't matter. I still can talk with you, or my hands. Even if I can't, well, it's very tricky. If I can't swallow, my nurse tells me the swallowing and the talking go together. I know you've been thinking about it for a very long time, yes, obviously, ever since you found out that you had ALS. But you told me when we spoke couple of weeks ago, and you've confirmed it again today, that your arms have weakened, your hands have weakened. Very much. 
So it's no longer a theoretical proposition. No way. It's a real thing. It's beginning. Very real. It's I beginning. cannot eat very easily now, and I expect in a week or two I may not be able to feed myself. And maybe I'm jumping, jumping the gun. Maybe it'll only be a month, but it's imminent. So let's put it that way. Matter of weeks. Right. How has your thinking process on it changed as you, as the contemplation of the inevitable comes closer now? Well, I don't know how the uh, weather has changed, because I think I told you before that I don't think you can think these things through. You have to experience them. You can think about what might happen, what you would like to do, and so on. But until the time actually arrives, you don't have the experience. And that's what makes the difference as to what I will do and how I'll do it. I undoubtedly will get depressed for a while. How long a while, I don't know. But that's my normal reaction. And then, maybe two days or three days later, I'll start to bounce back. That's my resilience. The last thing you and I talked about when I was here a few weeks ago was the means of your dying. And we whispered about it, right. and then I called you and said, is it okay if I use yes, it on the did. program? Right. This time we're not going to whisper. I'm just going to ask you, and if you, don't, and if you don't want to answer, you won't answer. I'll answer. How do you feel about that now? How do you feel about this notion of, I'll call it the, 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 Kevorkian, the Kevorkian option of, of putting in the hands of someone else the ability to give you the chance to make that final decision. That's, that's no. awkwardly put, but you know so what I'm I talking I know what about. you mean. I've thought about this a lot, and I found out some information from my nurse, that the hospice will come to your last days to make you comfortable. So you can't stay here. I can't stay here. And secondly, I've come to be aware of the fact that one of the qualities or the conditions and consequences of this illness is that your lungs will go. And unless you get a ventilator, you'll expire. And so I made a decision tentatively, open to revision, that that's the way I would go. That you would say no ventilator? No ventilator. Now, when you say, I've made a decision, open to revision, right. well, Nor, I mean, Maury, you're, you know, you're coming to a point where you got you to make a decision while you still can, right? I mean, you, you, you want to wait until the last minute, the last That's sort right. of wink of the eye, the no, last no, raising no. of the eyebrow? No, 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 you didn't understand me. My lungs are going to go before then because I have asthma and my lungs are very vulnerable. So. As a matter of fact, my nurse told me again that the lungs and the swallowing and the speech all go around the same time. So when we're talking about your loss of speech and your loss of the ability to swallow, what we've really been talking about is the end of morning. Perhaps. I don't know if she has it all right. I, don't, she, I assume she does. But if she's right, yes, that's the end. How much time there is between, I don't know. And I have to explore this with my neurologist. But it isn't tomorrow. I don't think it's next week. Because I don't feel any problem now in my lungs. So indeed, it is within that range. And that gives me some comfort on, the other hand, on one hand. On the other hand, I'm not in a hurry. When you're dead, you're dead a long time. I'm not in a hurry. But I'm going to live as fully as I can while I'm here, as lightly as I can, and as lovingly as I can. So I think I feel much more at ease about this now. And it appears that it will be this way, that I can take care of it at home, and that, you know, I'll go out and it will be, I hope, with a degree of inner peace. And, you know, but some feeling I've lived a good life.
Four months passed before Maury and I would meet for what would be our final on-camera conversation. By then, he and I had become friends, and it was no longer the objective business it had been when I first flew up to Boston six months earlier. So when Maury told me that he wasn't sure about recording a final conversation, that he'd been having some choking episodes, and that he really didn't want the camera rolling on such an undignified scene, it didn't seem right to try to persuade him. I said I'd call him back for his final decision. The next day, he said he did want to go ahead. It is a sensational day outside. Really? Does, does any of that have any impact on your life anymore? What it's like oh. outside? Only what I can see through my windows. I cannot get out. I move between this chair and my bed, mostly. So the world outside is an imagined world and sensed only in these narrow confines. Does that make you more introspective? Much more so. You had some doubts the other day when I called you up about whether we, oh. should, about whether we should do what will probably be our last session together. Right. Why did you have doubts? When you called Ted, and this has happened within the last month or two, I was terribly fatigued. Hardly any energy at all. And in addition, I have had a number of coughing spells in which the phlegm resided in my chest. I couldn't get it out. It would take me four hours, sometimes, of pounding and shaking by a physical therapist to get that stuff removed. And I was feeling too exhausted physically. And I said to myself, I don't want to be photographed as a spectacle, which I didn't think you would do. But if I was in that state, and that's what we were doing, that's what was happening, then it would be, that's how I was. But if all that we see of Maury's dying is this very dignified old man with a wonderful sense of humor and who has always had this little sparkle in his eye and who is always able to you know, very, put a very gentle, a very gentle spin on things. If that is all we see, we're not showing the whole process. It's a so. deception, if that's all you see. And I'm not into deception. All right. Then at Therefore, least, you're going to see it all. All right. In words, then, take us into it. You're more afraid now than you were a few months ago. No. No? I'm less afraid. Really? I'm less afraid, but I'm still afraid because I've been working on my fear. I am more concerned about going out in a way that is serene and composed. I'm more afraid of not going out that way. I'm not so afraid of the death. I'm afraid of the suffering that it might entail. And I have a little aphorism. Don't let go too soon, but don't hang on too long. Find the balance. The very notion, Maury, of letting go implies a degree of control. Yeah. You think you have that degree of control? I don't know. I'm going to try. What I can tell you is I'm letting go bit by bit right now of lots of things. Things. I don't read the newspapers much. I don't look at TV much. I listen to music. But there are a lot of things about the world 
I'm letting go. I'm not letting go of the people who love me. That will be the hardest thing, thing for them and for me. I'm concerned right now with the people who come into this house, all of whom are loving people, who love me deeply and I love them. The issue then becomes, how can I keep them in line? They are pounding on my door. I don't have enough time to see them all without exhausting myself. So it's very hard for me, but I've also got to protect myself because I am very, very easily fatigued. Let me stop you there. Why do you have to protect yourself? What are you protecting yourself from? You're dying. I will protect myself so I can go on the next day. Well, but wait a second. What is more important? I understand all these other trivialities, television, newspapers, uh, that, I, that I get. Uh, but there's nothing trivial about people who love you. Ted, intrinsic to my being is the capacity to respond. When I can't do that anymore, that's when I want to go. That's my criterion for the fact even though the body is functioning. When that is gone, more, more is gone. The capacity to be responsive to the other person in an emotional, feelingful way. If I can't do that anymore, forget it. That's how I feel. Well, you don't you don't have to do this if you don't want to. I'll, I'll help you put your glasses on. But I think a, a fairly simple way of demonstrating to people what the nature of this disease is, is if you would just show us. I'll try to put Try to put your glasses on. I'll I mean, be happy to do that. OK. Can't do it. You can't do it. No. Ah, thank you. By, by inference, then, I have to conclude that what I rather crudely set up the first time you and I met, the old asswipe test, you can't do that anymore, right? You can't. I am being fed now. I cannot feed myself. You can't feed yourself? At all. Any meal. And when you have to go to the bathroom, you need someone. Puts me on the commode, right. waits there, right. because I cannot sit. My trunk muscles are now deteriorated, so I cannot sit up straight. I'm listing all the time, so they have to hold me. When I'm done, they have to wipe me. They have to make sure that I'm held Otherwise, I'll flop over. That's how far it's gotten. How difficult has it been to adjust to that? I have no shame, because that's a cultural phenomena that we've had built into us. My dignity comes to my inner self. And the fact that I can keep myself composed and humorous if necessary, and Fully human, fully human, all the time. You you have written some new aphorisms that you wanted to read me, right. and you have written them f uh, for a book that that you are right. in the process of what dictating. Pos my first posthumous book. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if, if there's any way of doing a series of posthumous books, you're the fellow who's going to do it. Right well, here, let me, let me help you. You wanted, you wanted to read a few. Are, are these the these, aphorisms here? Yeah, these are additional ones. Okay. They're the original ones. 
identify the way in which you want to die, with fear, sorrow, rage, gentleness, acceptance, welcoming, denial, withdrawal, or serenity. You may go through each of these responses, but try to dig deep for your courage to stick with the one you want most. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, you're not prejudging. You're not suggesting that everyone is going to want to die with serenity. I'm just, that's why I mentioned all the others. Pick the one you want and try to get to it. I want to die with serenity. To keep connected and to let go. To be sad and to be happy at my loss of breathing function. I change my expectations from continuing to live to ceasing to live. That is the one of the most difficult things of all. Explain that. All your life, all my life, all of our lives, we get up in the morning and we expect to live, to go on. I have to change. I have to switch that whole thing around and build up and accept the expectation. I'm not going to live. Very soon, I will not be living. So, in preparing for it, I have to do that. I don't want to sop up all the energy you've got left, Maury, but you, you tell me, as we come to the end of, of this particular phase of the journey, if there's anything left that, that you want to say to several million people who have now, you know, come to regard you as in some small way a part of their own lives. The basic statement really is twofold, as far as I'm concerned. And we all learned it too late. to be compassionate with yourself and with each other, to be loving with yourself, towards yourself and with others, and to take responsibility for yourself and for all others. If we learn that lesson, this world would be so much better a place and we would be so much better human beings. Compassion, love, awareness, and responsibility for and to each other. That's the lesson I've learned. Why do you think it's so hard for people to learn that when they're in the full bloom of, of youth and vigor and have all their strength? Ego, ego, ego. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. If we could only see and take some detachment from our own ego and look at things the way they are rather than the way we want them to be, maybe we approach those things I talked about. We're too full of ego. Now it has its positive aspects, of course. That's what makes you do things. But on the other hand, it's that's what makes you destroy things, too. At Bosnia, Rwanda, wherever you go, people are acting out their ego. I am stronger. I will prevail. I will be powerful even if it means killing. We haven't evolved enough to have gotten to a place where we understand this. It's 
So we keep on mutilating each other, unfortunately. Does that touch you somewhere? Sure. Okay. So those were, I would say, and the last thing about death itself, I'm still saying the same thing. It's all a mystery. But I do believe there has to be something beyond. This material world is not sufficient given everything else that's happening. But what it is, I don't know. I promised everybody, if I can, I'll let them know. It's highly unlikely. I was just thinking, Maury, that so often on this program I say to people, any last thoughts? It has a whole different meaning when I say it to you. That's right. Any last thoughts? Well, I appreciate the fact that I can get my message across, that you are facilitators. And I would just repeat what Orton said the last line of one of his poems. And, oh, maybe that, yeah. Love each other or die. I think he's right. That's my last one. Maybe one of the angels? <clears throat> yeah, you'd be, you'd be cute with a pair of wings, Murray. Ah, Lord. There was an elfin-like quality to Maury. He was a tiny man to begin with, and his illness withered him even more. But precisely because he was so small and at the same time vibrant and vulnerable, you felt that you could let your guard down with him, that it wasn't necessary to use any of the masks that most of us assume to conceal our feelings so much of the time. He spoke as easily of dying and of his emotions as he did about his bodily functions so that anyone could recognize in Maury Schwartz a part of himself. And that is how most people reacted to these conversations when they were first broadcast, as something warm and familiar and helpful. Certainly that is how Maury intended it. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. Good night. The way I think about it now, I hope I'll discover new means and mechanisms when the time arrives. After you were on Nightline, the last time, you got some reaction. I sure did. Tell me about it. Well, there were lots of letters. This is from a teacher in a small Pennsylvania town called Perk Perkiomen Valley Middle School. And he, she has four girls and five boys, 10 to 13 eight years of age. Each of these kids lost a parent. And she's trying to get them to talk about it in a group. And the kids, especially the boys, are having a very hard time talking about it. And this is what I said. Dear Barbara Cott, that's the teacher, I was moved by your letter, this is me writing, and feel that the work you are doing with the children who have lost a parent is very important. I also lost a parent at an early age. I lost my mother, and you see I still can cry about her, at age eight. And it's quite a blow to me and unless you get a ventilator, 
it'll expire. And so I made a decision tentatively, open to revision, that that's the way I would go. That you would say no ventilator? No ventilator. Now when you say I've made a decision, open to revision, right. Nor, I mean, Maury, you're, you know, you're coming to a point where you got to, you got to make a decision while you still can, right? I mean, you, you, you want to wait until the last minute, the last That's sort right. of wink of the eye, the no, last no, raising no. of the eyebrow. No, 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 no. You didn't understand me. My lungs are going to go before then, because I have asthma, and my lungs are very vulnerable. So, as a matter of fact, my nurse told me again that the lungs and the swallowing and the speech all go around the same time. So when we're talking about your loss of speech and your loss of the ability to swallow, what we've really been talking about is the end of Maury. Perhaps. I don't know if she has it all right. I, don't, she, I assume she does. But if she's right, yes, that's the end. How much time there is between, I don't know. And I have to explore this with my neurologist. But it isn't tomorrow. No. May I be free from suffering. And just one phrase at a time, see if you can get behind each phrase. Really wishing yourself well. See how full you can be with each phrase. You told me that you were an agnostic from the time you were 16 until recently. What changed your mind? My impending death. And my meditation teacher and a growing sense of the interconnectedness between all of us. I don't know if we have time for me to tell you the story about the wave. It'll take about two minutes. You want to hear it? There's this little wave, this heat wave, who's bobbing up and down. I'll shorten it. Bobbing up and down on the ocean, having a great time. And all of a sudden, he recognizes he's going to crash into the shore. And this big, wide ocean, he's now walking, moving toward the shore. And we get annihilated. He gets so despairing. My God, what's going to happen to me? And he's got this sour, despairing look on his face. Along comes a female wave, bobbing up and down, having a great time. The female wave says to the male wave, why are you so depressed? Mail said, you don't understand. You're going to crash into that shore, and you'll be nothing. She says, you... Right ...where and how it would end. Looking back on it, I think everyone involved was glad that we'd done it. At the outset, though, Maury wasn't altogether sure that he wanted to do a television interview with me, but he was willing to consider the proposition. I had to audition for the supporting role in this human drama, Maury was afraid I might be too stuck up for the part. Television anchors who normally enjoy a broad, if shallow, fame tend to diminish in importance in direct proportion to where you're going. Maury is going to die. Before he does, he has some preconceptions about me that he wanted to share. You're narcissistic. I'm narcissistic? Yeah. No. You're not really. I'm too ugly to be narcissistic. I thought you was a narcissist when I saw you on TV. Really? Yep. Why is that? Because you, you acted as if you knew everything. And I said to your crew today, this is going to be a tough one for him because he doesn't know anything about dying. That's true. No. And, and I know more than you do. He does indeed. Maury, and it's not out of lack of respect, but at his insistence that everyone calls him by his first name, Maury knows more about dying than most people would care to learn. He suffers from a disease called ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. While the senses and the intellect remain intact until... ...to respond. When I can't do that anymore, that's when I want to go. That's my criterion for the fact that my life is over. Even though the body is functioning. When that is gone, Glory is God. The capacity to be responsive to the other person in an emotional, feelingful way. If I 
can't do that anymore. Forget it. That's how I feel. Mo, you don't you don't have to do this if you don't want to. I'll I'll help you put your glasses on. But I think a a fairly simple way of demonstrating to people what the nature of this disease is, is if you would just show us. I'll try to put try to put your glasses on. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Can't do it. You can't do it. No. Ah, thank you. By by inference, then I have to conclude that what I rather crudely set up the first time you and I met, the old ass wipe test. You can't do that anymore, right? You can't. I am being fed now. I cannot feed myself. You can't feed yourself at all. Any meal. And when you have to go to the bathroom, you need someone. Puts me on the commode, right. waits there, right. because I cannot sit. My trunk muscles are now deteriorated, so I cannot sit up straight. I'm listing all the time, so they have to hold me. When I'm done, they have to wipe me. They have to make sure that I'm held Otherwise, I'll flop over. That's how far it's gotten. How difficult has it been to adjust to that? I have no shame, because that's a cultural phenomenon that we've had built into us. My dignity comes from my inner self. And the fact that I can keep myself composed. Because interaction and relationships and, and the loving relationships I have just maintain me. They just keep me alive in a very, very vital way. Now there are days when I'm depressed. Let me not deceive you. When I see my hands going, a certain dread arises in me. What am I going to do without my hands? I'll have no control anymore. Control either physical control or command, well, now come to the voice, or command control when my voice goes. So there are a lot of things that are happening, the voice and the hands, the swallowing, I don't care so much about, so they'll feed me through a tube. But these two things are such an essential part of me. I'm a Jewish man, I talk with my hands, you know, and I have Jewish inflections sometimes, I like to use Yiddish words. That'll be all gone. What do I do? And how will I be? Talk to me a little bit about just contemplating silence. The fact of the matter is, all my life, I have expected to talk, ever since I learned how to talk. And that expectation is ingrained in me. Just like you expect to live, that when you have to face non-living or non-talking, is it to Very true. Very true. I'd like to talk to you. Um, people with ALS, um, when they begin to have the respiratory failure, I sometimes they're trached. They'll have a, a hole cut here, and they'll be trached. Um, and then they'll be put on a ventilator so they can breathe better. Well, that's a decision that I'll have to talk with my sons and my mm -hmm. wife about. Mm -hmm. I assume you've seen a lot of people on these things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the quality of their life? Well, Can they interact with people? Sure, sure. Are they energetic in the same way I am energetic now? Well, Are they alive? Are they taking the world in? Are people dealing with them? Uh, or mm -hmm. All those things? What's the alternative if I don't take this thing? That would be respiratory failure. It would be much, That's much, a good way to go. much more quickly. Is it uh, horrible death? Are you choking or uh, yeah? 
For how long? It would come, the choking starts, um, you know, your, your swallowing ability is fine right now, obviously. Um, you'll have more decreased ability to swallow. You'll have episodes where you choke, and then eventually that's usually how you, you will how die. You'll choke to death. Talk about it for a moment. What, what happens with Lou Gehrig's disease? A lot of people out there don't know what Lou Gehrig's disease is. I don't know a lot about it either, but I'll tell you what I do. But not waiting for it. No, doing it when I feel that the quality of my life has been destroyed to such a degree that I can't go on because I don't want to go on. It isn't worth going on. It isn't worth going on because I'm not able to do the things that make me who I am like relating to people with affect, with enthusiasm, with, on the other hand, on the other hand, and I have to give you the other hand. When I talked to this with, about this with my meditation teacher, she said, maybe you'll want to go on just to be an inspiration to other people. So I have to consider this too. Can I be? Will I be? Might I be? Must you be? Must I be? It's all up for grabs. I don't know the answer right now. When this all started, I said to myself, am I going to live or am I going to die? Meaning by that, am I going to withdraw like most people probably do? and give up on the world because it's been so horrible to me. Now, how am I going to live? I decide Sometimes they're traked. They'll have a, a hole cut here and they'll be traked. Um, and then they'll be put on a ventilator so they can breathe better. Well, that's a decision that I'll have to talk with my sons and my mm -hmm. wife about. Mm -hmm. I assume you've seen a lot of people on these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the quality of their life? Well, Can they interact with people? Sure, sure. Are they energetic in the same way I am energetic now? Well, Are they alive? Are they taking the world in? Are what people you're going to be able to do. dealing with them? Uh, or mm -hmm. All those things? What's the alternative if I don't take this thing? That would be respiratory failure. It would be much, That's much, a good way to go. much more quickly. Is it uh, horrible death? Are you choking or, uh, yeah, for how long? It would come, the choking starts, um, you know, your, your swallowing ability is fine right now, obviously. Um, you'll have more decreased ability to swallow. You'll have episodes where you choke, and then eventually that's usually how you, you will how die. You'll choke to death. Talk about it for a moment. What, what happens with Lou Gehrig's disease? A lot of people out there don't know what Lou Gehrig's disease is. I don't know a lot about it either, but I'll tell you what I do know. The nurse was just here today. My hands are going, which is the next phase after the legs. What does that mean when you say your hands are going? I won't be able to use them in a the short while. Things are very heavy to pick up. That's what I believe. You're part of the ocean. That's right. I'm not a wave. I'm part of all of humanity. So you're not going to die? I'm going to die, but I'm also going to live on. In some other form, who knows? But I truly believe that I am part of a larger whole of some power. People call it God. I don't know if that's the right term for it. But I had to take time to get there. And now is the time to be there. But it's all a mystery. I still don't know the answer. I don't want to represent myself as a girl. I'm struggling to find what the answer is. But what I do know, what for me is the best way to handle this fatal illness and move into the next domain, whatever that is. Maury, you and I are doing something that, that doesn't seem to be much in favor in this mm. country. We're not only talking mm. about death, we're, we're laughing. Right. right. We're making jokes about it, right. being, Absolutely. being a little bit irreverent about it. Absolutely. Uh, although there are times when clearly... I am very sad about it. Very sad. Uh, very sad. You clearly feel that we should talk about it more. More and more and more. For me, it's one of the most important things. If you at the hospice will come to your last days and 
to make it comfortable. So you can stay here. I can stay here. And secondly, I've come to be aware of the fact that one of the qualities or the conditions and consequences of this illness is that your lungs will go. And unless you get a ventilator, you'll expire. And so I made a decision tentatively, open to revision, that that's the way I would go. That you would say no ventilator? No ventilator. Now when you say I've made a decision, open to revision, right. Well, Nor, I mean, Maury, you're, you know, you're coming to a point where you got to, you got to make a decision while you still can, right? I mean, you, you, you want to wait until the last minute, the last That's sort right. of wink of the eye, the no, last no, raising no. of the eyebrow. No, 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 no. You didn't understand me. My lungs are going to go before then, because I have asthma, and my lungs are very vulnerable. So, as a matter of fact, my nurse told me again that the lungs and the swallowing and the speech all go around the same time. So when we're talking about your loss of speech and your loss of the ability to swallow, what we've really been talking about is the end of No, it needs Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So what do you think I'm gonna find the next time I come to visit? Thursday. When are you gonna call me next time? Well, if I'm not talking, there's no point calling you, is there? You want me to call you right before I can't talk anymore, if I can judge that? Because that's the critical thing between us. If we're going to be on TV, I can't do it with sign language. So I guess that's the answer. If I lose my arms, it doesn't matter. I still can talk with you, with my hands, even if I can't. Well, it's very tricky. If I can't swallow, my nurse tells me the swallowing and the talking go together. I know you've been thinking about it for a very long time, yes, obviously, ever since you found out that you had ALS. But you told me when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, and you've confirmed it again today, that your arms have weakened, your hands have weakened. Very much. So it's no longer a theoretical proposition. No way. It's a real thing. It's beginning. Very real. It's I beginning. cannot eat very easily now, and I expect in a week or two I may not be able to feed myself. And maybe I'm jumping, jumping the gun. Maybe it'll only be a month, but it's imminent. So let's put it that way. Matter. There's going to be lots of love passing between us, and you don't need speech or hearing for that. And I know about whom you're talking, my dear friend Maury Stein. And Maury and Stein and I have had a 35-year relationship, and we may not need speech or hearing. We just may need to be in each other's presence, in which we experience the depth of our feeling for each other. Now, they might, that might not be enough, but it's a considerable amount. Hi, Maury. Hi, Maury. Hi, Maury. <laughs> That's really Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. I didn't think the watch is Hello? Yeah. Hi, Fern. How are you going to go on giving when you no longer have the use of your voice? Are you coming? That's going to be an interesting challenge. I might tell my friends, which I am right now by saying this, you frame your questions in yes or no ways. Tell me what's in your heart and in your mind. And if there's some question you want to ask about it, just put it in that way. Okay, yes, I said something about morning before. The morning never stops. There are some mornings when I cry and cry mourn and mourn for myself. That this is my sorry pass. I got dealt this hand. Some mornings I'm angry and bitter, but it doesn't last too long. Then I get up and say, I want to live. 
So I have to cry, and I have to mourn, but I also have to enjoy the life I have left. Maury is the first to admit his good fortune in having such a vast support system surrounding him. Get this support system. As many people around you who love you as you possibly can, stay with them. They'll stay with you, they'll come back and forth and so on, let you know that they love you. And let you know that you matter to them in their lives. I told you you have a title for it? No, what? Ah, after six years, a title. Oh, right. Somebody said, look, with what you're going through, is there anything you'd like to ask of us? You know, is there any way we can be helpful? And Maurice said, in his typical way, let me think about it. So the next time we met, two weeks later, he had a list. He said, you know, if you really want to help, these are things I'd like. If you don't, that's okay. A meditation teacher told me something that blew my mind the other day. I wish you were here. Narayan, where are you? She said to me, Maury, maybe your view of life and death should be reconsidered. Maybe the distance between life and death isn't as great as you think. And I said, you mean it's not a chasm? The two mountains and that big valley between? I, this is my words now. You mean it's only a little bridge across a small river? I don't know. But there's another view. This culture is so stuck on death in terms of its fear, hiding it, not knowing what to do with it, that what I'm saying is an alternative way of looking at it. There's a charming quality to dying in that it teaches us a level of humility that we're incapable of having, I suppose, yeah. while we're healthy, while we're just full of the sense of our own importance and vitality. Right, right. Now, of course, the minute that you have a disease that you know is going to kill you, right. 